There, there, everybody. Welcome to episode five of series three, Reality Check on How You Going with Jason Owen. Um, a really big thank you to everyone who's tuning in each week to check it out. It's great chatting to all different types of people from reality television and, and uh, you know, getting their insights as to how they find the experience going through TV and, and um, you know, just what it's like to give everyone the insights. And of course, there's many people out there that want to apply for reality shows. So, it just gives everyone an insight as to what exactly it's like to go on one of these shows. So it's been really fun so far and I hope everyone's enjoying it and we're looking forward to putting some new series in the works in the coming months. But tonight we're um, we're joined by Gerald uh, out of Survivor. Gerald was eliminated from Survivor last Sunday um, where he was blindsided. Um, it was pretty intense. It was an intense episode, I've got to say, and um, it's a great show, Survivor. It's, it's great fun watching it and watching everyone go through it and test themselves. It's incredible what they can do and what they do do on the show. So tonight we're joined by Gerald and um, we're going to go over and have a chat to him about his experience on Survivor and and uh, also he's a great guy. We're just going to go and have a yarn. So here we go. So, and Gerald joins us now. How are you, buddy? Oh, I'm doing swimmingly, mate. Oh. Pleasure to be Oh, mate, thank you for coming on the show. We really, really appreciate it. It's uh, it's great to chat to different people all the time. And, um, of course, everyone's got to see you on uh, Survivor the last, you know, few weeks. It's been fantastic to watch. And, uh, obviously, we seen you get blindsided by George there the other night. Um, were you disappointed you didn't make it any further, mate? Oh, look, I was, I was devastated I didn't get further. I was just uh, starting to get into the pointy end of my game, how I was planning to play my game. Uh, coming forward, I, I'd been playing that real good social game, trying to keep in with everyone. And then, of course, after merge, 10 was the number where I was really going to try and start pushing to the front and um, making some of them big moves because I'd kept it out of the limelight and I'd uh, kept the, the votes off me the whole time and, and kept them really strong alliances good until then. Yeah. But uh, wasn't to be. Yeah, that's that's the thing, mate. It's a bit like that with, with with shows, isn't it? You know, it's just a matter of going on, enjoying yourself, going for gold, and, and what's going to be is going to be, I guess, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, mate. And I did exactly that. I had an absolute ball while I was there, and I met some amazing people and uh, experiences for life of things that you never would have dreamt that you would have done. Right. No, that's right. Absolutely, mate. No, good on you. That's fantastic. Um, mate, why, why did you go on Survivor? I've got to ask you that question. Did you, were you a fan of the show before you went on it? Yeah, look, I've been a fan of Survivor for a lot of years. I've, I've watched a fair bit of Survivor in my time. Uh, but it, it was sort of a roundabout thing how I happened to, to get there. I wasn't one of the people that sort of went out of my way to apply. It was always one of them things that I just looked at and thought, you know, it, that'd be fun. but you never go to try and do it. And it was actually a mate from WA that uh, competes wood chopping as well that actually put my name forward. And uh, that's how I ended up there. When I uh, got the call from, from one of the producers that uh, asked me to do an, do an interview and stuff and uh, apply, that was sort of like a, uh, a little moment where I was like, oh, should I, shouldn't I? Like, it's something I wanted to do. Do I want to try and put myself out there? And the more that I did, I was... 100% so happy that I decided to push myself forward because it was one of those things where I'm always trying to find something to extend myself and to push myself further and to, to get better in everything you do in life and uh, to improve yourself as a person and your social skills and your outreach with people and, and meet new people and stuff. And it ticked every one of those boxes. Oh, mate, good on you. No, I tell you what, well, you certainly you found the right thing to test yourself further. <laughs> yeah, I certainly certainly did there. Oh, mate, absolutely, absolutely. So, were you afraid of the water water challenges, mate? Were you? Did, did, did you not swim or something like that? Were you? No. So they made, they made it out like I don't swim. Uh, so I, I I do swim and I can I can swim fine. I, I can swim to the extent of swimming. I'm certainly not a flick or Emmett or Simon <laughs> or someone who's an Olympic grade swimmer. That's for sure. You've got to know your strengths and know your weaknesses. And I think that's one of the greatest powers, knowing your weaknesses. And in those tribal challenges, uh, I was willing to step back and, and to let those people go forward so that we could try and win as a tribe. Because you've got to know your weaknesses and know what you're good at. Uh, and I can step up and own that, that I'm not going to be as good as Emmett or Flick or someone that does that 
every day. You give me anything on land and I will take the best of them. Uh, but you just got to do what you can do. And in those individual challenges, that's a different story where you, where you step up and you, you do it for yourself. But um, yeah. So mate, yeah, absolutely. And I've got to, I've got to ask, like when you come out of the show there last weekend, what's the first meal that you had? Because there's not much oh. in there food wise, is there? There's, there's not much in there food wise. No. Uh, <laughs> when I came up, the first thing I had a jury villa was uh, I had a glass of milk and a dirty big burger. It was glorious. I then hooked into a plate full of sausages and steak. Good on you, mate. My favourite. My bloody favourite. <laughs> a good old sausage and steak, mate. You can't what a combination. Meat, meat, more meat and milk. That's it. Absolutely bloody beautiful, mate. Fantastic. How did you cope with the lack of food, mate? I've got to ask you, because that wouldn't be easy. Uh, look, the first couple of weeks were certainly trying uh for the lack of food and it, it, there was certain moments where it, it was pretty pretty hard but uh after the first two or three weeks it, it wasn't bad once my body acclimatized to it it really wasn't that bad there was days later on in the game where I, I just wasn't even hungry i just i didn't even eat didn't even eat the rice like i, I just wasn't hungry mm. um but i think that having Put on a few kilos before I went in on purpose to try and, and build up a, a bit of extra fat reserves uh, going in, so my body didn't start eating this muscle and uh, whatnot. When your body starts degrading its own muscle, that's when you start feeling tired, lethargic, etc. And I felt good. Day day thirty two, I felt a million bucks. Like I was even going for runs in the morning up the riverbed some mornings, and yeah, I, I felt really good. Yeah, no, well, and that's it's funny you say that about you know how you sort of didn't find yourself you know, eating as much as time went on, because it's like doing a, a um, you know, ketosis diet or, or something like that. I find if you don't eat for a while, like, it, or you're fasting or whatever type of diet you might be on, you find you don't want it anymore. You find you yeah, don't want the food. It's like your stomach shrinks or something. It's got to be what it is. Well, a lot of it is, is habit. It's just general habit of snacking, going out there and having a big meal two, three times a day at those certain times. Once you break that habit, which most habits around 14 to 20 days are, are habit forming. Uh, and once you get past that stage of, of habit forming, you form new habits, which is not eating too much, ju just having rice, whatever. Uh, and your body doesn't crave it as much because you, you're creating those new habits. And I found that once I got to Drew Villa and actually started eating, uh, I, I felt pretty shit. Uh, a lot of the days for eating and i actually went back I, I, I got them to go and get me rice i started cooking rice and eating rice in jury villa <laughs> well, not, a, not, a word, not a word of a joke <laughs> yeah mate did you lose much you dropped much weight in there <laughs> so yeah I, I did lose a bit uh it was funny when i went to the doctors before i uh before i went on i actually said to my doctor do you like what's going to happen i'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose a lot of weight of course and he goes uh yeah, you're going to start losing weight when you stop eating anything fatty, uh, et cetera. And I said, oh, what, like pies, sausage rolls, chips, et cetera. And he's like, no, nah, just when you stop eating fatty. I, <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. But, yeah, I, I did. I lost 18 kilos in there uh, in 33 days. So that's over half a kilo a day. That's that's a pretty big weight drop uh, and pretty quick. But again, a lot of that was would have been water weight and that extra weight that I put on, that extra four or five kilos, which the bulk of it would have been like uh, pure coverage, pure fat, because it was just, uh, it was really quick weight gain over the course of only about eight or 10 weeks. Uh, so a lot of that fell off quick, of course. But um, yeah, it's still a massive number to lose in 33 days. Bloody oath, mate. Absolutely. I'd, I'd love to lose some weight like that, eh? I might have to reply to yeah. Bloody un unbelievable. I don't know how I'd go in there, but I'd, I definitely could do with some weight loss. I know that much. <laughs> oh, the best story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I've got to ask you, it looked like obviously it was quite physical. It was full on in there. Did it reek in there? Like the bloody, it looked sweaty and hot, bloody, I, I don't know. Like what was it like with everyone else in there? 
Yeah, you know, it was nowhere near as bad as you'd think uh, for people stinking and stuff. Like, there was a lot of sweating went on, of course, with challenges yeah. and stuff. But unlike being on an island or on the beach or anywhere like that that's tropical, that you have that humidity and you get that really bad body odour, uh, out there, it's a dry heat. Uh, and everything dried off straight away. Nothing stuck around. And for the, for the bulk of it, Everyone was pretty good. No one had really bad BO or anything. Oh, that's great, mate. That's real great. I was worried you were going to say it. I was worried you were going to say, I was worried you were going to say it was in there, and I'm thinking, oh, no. You know, but but, it was a lot better than you'd expect. Oh, absolutely. Well, it's funny you said that because I would have thought it would have been, you know, but bad in there because you, you just imagine it would be from an outside yeah. view. Yeah. No, that's, that's great, mate. The perks of having no humidity at all, but there's also a downside to that with everyone's lips just falling to bits after about day three or four, just drying out and all, all that sort of stuff was just, that was, that was hard. And it's, again, it's the climate, you know, there's pros and cons to both. So Absolutely, mate. Absolutely. So you obviously made it onto the jury and we'll be seeing, you know, you for a little while longer on our screens now. Um, is it kind of fun to be able to sort of sit back um, and I presume a bit of a nice, nicer accommodation to be there, there of course, um, for a few weeks and just turning up every few days for the jury, mate? Like, is, is it good? Enjoying it? Yeah, look, jury is certainly a completely different kettle of fish to being in the game. Uh, I would much rather still be in the game, uh, not only for the prize, but for uh, the company and the... Uh, the general environment that you're putting with those people uh, when you're out there, there's no escape from it. You have genuine connections with people and you get to talk to people without any of those distractions of life, any escape from it. Mm. There's no other things to go and do. You're literally just finding food, water, et cetera, cooking food or hanging out. That's the extent of it, unless you're doing a challenge, of course. Uh, but Jury Villa is, is certainly nice. Uh, the beds and stuff are sort of hit and miss. Uh, but going back to that after you've, again, formed a habit of being out there, uh, it is really hard. That first night in Jury Villa, I hardly slept a wink. Mm. Uh, I would much rather be sleeping back on the sand again. But, but the soft beds, being quiet, there's no crackle of the fire, there's no... All of those combinations of things, after you form those habits, are really, really hard to break again. No, we're only just talking about that with the food, mate. It's the same thing, isn't exactly. it? Same thing. You form those habits, and uh, that's what your body craves and, and wants after that. Yeah, mate, absolutely. I, I wanted to ask you um, how you felt, what it was like to have people lie to your face and fo but form friendships with you at the same time. Like, I've got to ask you about that because it's it's pretty intense in there um, in that regard. Um, is it mentally stressful? Uh, yeah, look, you always sort of question everything, but I'm, I'm the kind of person that I'm very uh, <clears throat> confident in my judgment. Uh, and if I make a judgment call, uh, I, I stick to that and that's uh, what I, I believe. And anyone can say anything else around me and, it doesn't sway me too much, unless there's overwhelming evidence, of course. I look at the evidence behind everything rather than just what I'm being told to my face, uh, which I think helped me a lot. And a lot of people don't do that. They take everything at face value and they take on board everything that's being said. And I sort of read behind what's being said and, and look at actions more than what's actually being said. Uh, and, and I think that's uh, a lot of how I play played my game out there this time because I, I went out there to this time play the most honest game of Survivor that's ever been played. And that's just the way I wanted to play this time. I wanted to try and change it up from the gen, the general uh, quid pro quo of you've got to go out there, lie, cheat, stab people in the back all the time. I wanted to show that you can use the truth as your biggest weapon if you want it. You can do it without having to directly lie to people to their face etc and i stuck by that the whole time when someone would come and suggest something that i didn't want to do or whatever instead of me actually lying i just i just sort of stand and listen and i, I just wouldn't give an give an answer to them yeah uh so i, ne I never actually i never lied to them 
uh, whereas people like George would just stand there and blatantly lie to your face, which was um, certainly the exact opposite approach. Because I, I wanted what I said to have an impact. Everything I said was straight down the line, didn't go back on my word, etc. And it was those two clashing uh, personality traits, I guess, or, or ways that you want to live your life that uh, are the two biggest things out there that you don't usually see a lot of what I was doing. And uh, I think that's another reason why people wanted to, to work with me in the game was yeah. because they saw that and from early on that if I said I was going to vote this way, that's the way I voted. Uh, and if I said I was going to stick with these people, that's who I stuck with, yeah. uh, et cetera. And uh, I think that was a, a really positive takeaway. And I think they helped me build really close connections with a lot of, if not all the people that uh, were out there and that I worked with in particular. Yeah, no. And I think the way you approached it, mate, was fantastic because as you said, you know, let's not beat around the bush. Let's just do this the way we're going to do it. I'm who I am. This is who I want to be. This is me. This is the way I'm going to approach it. You like it, you like it, you don't, you don't. And I think that's that's just the mentality of, of everything, you know. I think people should be like that all the time, mate. I really do. I think you've done a bloody fantastic job. I really yeah, do. Yeah, no, and I, that's what I, I went out there to do and be how I am in real life, which is basically the exact opposite of what 99% of people do on Survivor. And I've, as I said, I've watched a lot of Survivor and I've, I've seen how people do all this. and uh I, I went out there to try and do something different yeah because anyone can go out there and lie and cheat and and dig holes for yourself and, and throw yourself in them any anyone can do that but to be able to keep a straight face not fall into those lies not have to try and dig yourself out of those holes because you didn't put them in there are, are completely different aspects that you don't usually see in survivor and I guess a lot of people think that that has to be boring all the time and that's why they don't do it. Uh, and I guess that's why I didn't get quite as much airtime as some, I suppose. Uh, it's because I was so straight down the line and direct with everything I did. Uh, and I, I think that it had good and bad aspects, but it also has immense power when you want it to. Because if you're digging holes and spinning those webs of lies, uh, those holes just get deeper and those webs get thicker. But the truth is always the truth. And a perfect example of digging these holes when you start lying is the vote when Haley went to redemption. And I walked into tribal and I knew full well that George was the mole. I'd known from the moment the Kez got voted out that George was the mole and Kara had to be in on it to some degree. Yeah. Uh, I worked that out very quickly. Uh, and I went into that vote and we, we'd already decided we were voting at Haley. It was never going to change. As I said, if I said we were voting for someone, that's who we voted for. Yeah. Uh, and when I went in there, I went in there with the sole intention of dropping that truth bomb and letting them both just dig graves. They'd spun lies at some point and they were just digging their own graves. And all I did was say the truth and let them try and explain it. And all of a sudden they start digging holes. I believed Kaylee in what she said, because what she was saying at tribal was the truth. And I knew that that was what was happening, but she'd already spun some lies two days before. And the more you talk, the bigger that hole gets. Even if you are telling the truth by that point, it's like the boy that cried wolf and George by not saying anything. Well, everyone can see straight through that. Uh, and it's just so evident. And all you had to do was speak the truth and watch the chaos unfold. Yeah, yeah, that's right, mate. No, it, I reckon it was absolutely perfect the way you approached everything in there, mate. It's a credit to you. Now, mate, we've got something a bit in common. Um, you're a country fella like myself. Um, I grew up about 130 k's west of Dubbo, and I'm currently out here, you know, waiting out good old lockdown at the moment like the rest of us. Um, you're from Kilcoy up in central Queensland, mate, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Sure Mate, I've been up that way. I've been up that way plenty of times. Um, why is it so special to you up there, mate? That's that's you're born and bred up there. Your, your family are up there. What it, what's yeah? Just wanted to ask you. Yeah, so Kilcoy uh, to me, it's it's my home. It's been my family's home and heritage for over 140 years. Uh, my great great grandfather selected the place that uh, we live on 
he, well, my old man lives on. Uh, and we've been there ever since. And you know, basically our whole heritage in Australia as a family has been here. And we've been looking after this land and custodians of this place ever since. And uh, I, I personally think that we're in one of the best spots for farming uh, in the world. I, I've traveled the world competing and I've seen a lot of country. And I'll tell you what, there's not many uh, places, if any, that I've been to. And when I come back home and walk into where the old man lives and look down on the big black saw flats there where we cultivate and used to have all the dairy cows and, and that you just look around and go, well, why would you go anywhere else when the best country in the world is right here on my doorstep? Good on you, mate. You're fifth generation. Yeah. Yeah. Farmers. Yeah. Yeah. So we had, uh, we had two dairies uh, on both sides of my family. Uh, we actually closed both of them dairies down. We closed down one in 2010, the other one down in 2012. Uh, just because of the the milk slump and uh, the state of the dairy industry up here in Queensland, uh, which is which is pretty sad uh, in the last few years, uh, with the advent of the improvements in in New Zealand and uh, the going forward over there uh, in terms of their water management and uh, their future infrastructure that's been done uh, over there uh, by the government as well as the farmers and and the u farmers unions over there. Uh, and now we're solely graziers. We, we've got beef cattle uh, all the way from Kilcoy nearly through to Gamari, where our other places are up there. Uh, and that's, that's what we do. We run them, mainly Brahmins nowadays, to combat the cattle tick problem up here. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's how we roll. Mate, I, um, I wanted to ask you, like, obviously, was it, was it tough, for, like, the past few years with the drought and everything like that that's been, you know, hitting regional areas of Australia? Um, getting feed and stuff like that for, for the cattle? Yeah, uh, the, the last couple of years uh, until sort of this year for the last three years have been really tough. We had uh, a couple of really bad droughts up, up here, uh, some of the worst we've ever had. And as I said, we've been here for over 140 years and mm. they, they were, without a doubt, some of the, the worst we've ever had. And I was literally going out every day and and shooting cattle that were were in a really bad way and putting cattle out of the misery and stuff. And they were cattle that we were feeding every day and had been for six, eight, 10 months uh, straight, as well as we were digging for water in creeks and stuff with excavators every day, trying to, to get more water and feed. And it, it was just a situation that didn't end. It looked like it was gonna come to an end and you'd get a little shower and then there was just nothing after it and the little tiny shoots would come up and then just burn off again. Uh, and it was it was really tough, and we did that for nearly three years straight. We were, we were feeding cattle out, and uh, even when we thought we had some reprieve in the middle, we got a uh, couple really short, sharp, heavy falls, uh, and the grass shot away. But it was never enough to even run any water, and then we were running out of water with a little bit of, with some feed coming up, uh, and it, it was a really tough time. And uh, we were really doing it tough for a long time, and without any real help from anyone anywhere and you just got to pull through as farmers and try and band together as a community and uh, and make those things happen we had we were trying to get feed in uh from down in victoria south australia we got some from the territory uh over the course of sort of two years uh and it's it was a, a really uh tough time in general because we'd even used the feed that we had and, and made because we bail our own and stuff as well but to not even be able to get anything anywhere in the local district or even in the state was uh, was really tough. Yeah. Well, mate, I, I get around quite a lot, um, you know, to farming families and people in, in rural areas of Australia with my own little charity called Doing It For Rural Aussie Kids. And we go out and, you know, we support families in need of, you know, Christmas time or whatever it might be. And by doing it for the kids, we find it supports the families, you know, and we also buy local and support local businesses and so forth like that. But, you know, people in metropolitan areas right now, um, they say, oh, because, you know, certain parts of Queensland might have been in flood or New South Wales might have been in flood or whatever, the drought's over. But they don't yeah. understand that the past, you know, five to 10 years of, of a hard drought, people have had to sell off, you know, all their livestock, they've had to to kill some of them they've had to do everything you know sell machinery just to live to see their families through a hard time just because it you know might be a little bit of water in the dam and a, a you know a bit of feed shooting through can't buy all that back mate can it yeah a hundred percent mate and um i've got 
family, uh, a lot of family around her, but all uh, in the farming industry as well. And one of uh, my relatives uh, out at around Bark Alden and uh, Winton, they, they got the same issue. They were out there and they'd been in hard drought for four, just over four years straight. And then that, uh, that big cyclone came down through the Gulf uh, and dropped all that rain in a hurry. And uh, it flooded and, and they, they literally lost thousands of head. The, the cattle would just walk in the water and uh, just trying to walk to get away from the rain. And they'd get to a, a corner in the paddock after 10, 15 kilometres and uh, they'd stand there and the water came up around them. And, and sadly, they lost hundreds in mobs and it, it was uh, absolutely heartbreaking. And that's what people see. They see that a bit of rain come and they think that that's the end of it. But in, in sometimes it can even make it worse. And it was the same uh, same here when we got that bit of rain and the grass jumped away and everyone thought that the, the drought was over because the bit of green grass had uh, come through and uh, there was still no water. We're completely out of water. And what, what good is having any feed when you've got no water either? Uh, water is even more important than feed. So uh, it's tough and a lot of people don't see or understand that. And, and that's the, <clears throat> the education that we need to try and uh, give to the public and, and give them that knowledge to make informed decisions uh, about all of these issues. Uh, and, and that's what I try and achieve by being a rural ambassador uh, for Queensland, which I was uh, through the Queensland show movement uh, and by attending all of the, the shows that I go to right around Australia and Queensland, uh, trying to raise that awareness and educate the public uh, to these problems and enlighten them to some of the possible solutions. Yeah, no, no, well said, mate. And that's the thing, the more attention we can bring on that, um, hopefully the more help or some help we will be able to receive uh, in time, you know. So we've just got to keep that attention growing on, on that aspect of, of the farming world. Um, mate, back in 2019, you were crowned the world champion woodchopper. Holy crap. Yeah, yeah, so... <laughs> I, uh, I won the first first world title yet in 2019. Uh, I, I placed second about four times in world championships prior to that and uh, finally managed to crack one at the start of 2019. Uh, after uh, having an injury, I'd actually managed to nip off the end of my toe in January trying to defend an Australian title at Brunswick Heads. And uh, I had two or three months off uh, to recover from that and came back to one of my first shows, which was a world championship up in Toowoomba and uh, managed to, to get a win there. Uh, so that was, I was absolutely stoked with that. And uh, it, it was certainly a, a culmination of a lot of years of hard work. Yeah. Oh, mate, that's incredible. Absolutely. That's, that's an amazing achievement. What, what's your fastest time, mate? Uh well, it, it really depends. Wood it also, is, it also depends on what you're cutting, you're cutting, I guess. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I cut a 12-inch underhand in a big championship uh, at Longview in Washington State in uh, the US uh, in what we think is the fastest 12-inch underhand that's ever been cut in any type of hardwood. I cut that in 9.9 seconds, broke the US record over there. So that was, uh, that was a, pretty, a pretty big moment that I'm, I'm pretty proud of. Good on you, mate. No, that's unbelievable. And, and how, like, how did you get into all that? I've got to ask you, like, how, how did that all come about? And is there much, there'd have to be a lot of work in it, wouldn't there? Like training, practicing, is there anything like that in it? Yeah, 100%. I got into it through a family friend, uh, actually at a local show at Kilcoy. Uh, I, I'd always seen it as a kid and looked at it and thought that that is awesome and something that I'd love to have a crack at, but I'd never got the chance to actually have a crack at woodjobbing because I was always competing, riding horses. That's what I did. I'd camp drafting, sporting. Uh, etc. I, I did that and I've competed for my state and, and for Australia doing that as well uh, and that always took up all my time on weekends and when I got the opportunity to actually have a crack back in uh, about 2009 yeah. uh, I jumped at the chance and just did Kilcoy Show, my little local one and I actually I won the under 18s event that was on at the time there and then I did a couple more little local ones and uh, the next year I did a few more, I did about eight shows for the year and then the next year uh i did probably 15 or 20 and nowadays well not not this year of course but uh, most of the time i did uh, i do 70 or 80 country shows a year and uh five big royal shows all the capital cities in australia and uh 
travel New Zealand, America, Canada, into Europe. So it's absolutely phenomenal where it's been able to take me and the place it's been able to go and the contacts and amazing friends and people I've been able to uh, to meet along the way. Yeah, well, as as you just sort of said then, you haven't been able to do too much of that this year, um, you know, with everything that's been happening anyway, regardless. But um, how has COVID affected that sort of the, the wood chopping scene, mate, in that regard? Like, I guess they just can't do it at the moment. Yeah, look, in, in Australia, it's really hit it hard. Uh, we thought we're just starting to get some things back on track sort of uh, early to mid this year. We, we ran a couple of shows and uh, we're, we're just starting to do a few things because we'd had 12 months where basically nothing had happened. It was just gone in an instant. Uh, and it's, it's sort of doubly hard for me because it's it's – my competition, which is my pastime as well as my profession, but also my business, which is making axes and selling competition axes around the world, is also that. So I lost all three in one go. I lost my income. I lost my pastime as well as I lost my profession and what I train every day for all in one go. And uh, working for myself and, and competing for prize money rather than being paid a wage, uh, you, you get no subsidy from the government for that. So it was just all gone uh, in one fell swoop. But uh, luckily, I uh, my business is sort of a bit versatile. That I'm not an Australian only business. A lot of my gear that I make and sell goes overseas, goes to New Zealand, the US, uh, or through Europe. Uh, which over there, those guys are, st- are competing now. They're back in the full swing of things in the US and Canada. Uh, as well as through Europe. Uh, so that was sort of the little pick-me-up that even though we've got nothing here, uh, they're competing. So I, I could just at least still sell some gear. Yeah. But uh, here there's still, of course, there's, there's nothing now. It's all been canceled. We had, we've got a couple of little country shows left here in Queensland. There's only about two or three left that haven't been canceled. And uh, fingers crossed and touch wood, those shows get to go ahead, uh, yeah. not only for wood, but for the communities. Like, the, uh, the support those shows provide to those communities and the income and revenue that comes from it, as well as the tourism and education uh, is vital for those communities, hey? 100%, mate, 100%. The little communities rely on those events every year. You know, that it brings accommodation, like money in through accommodation. It brings, you know, business for the local coffee shop, the service stations, the bloody whatever it might be in the towns, you know, and, and as, as we both know, growing up in these rural areas, you see it each and every year that the communities rely on these specific events. So, um, you know, it's, it's really yeah. important that this picks back up and we can get things moving again, buddy, hey? Yeah, 100%, because it's also the opportunity for all those local people that look forward to that every year to showcase their own stuff and what they've been working on too. That's their opportunity to network with people and uh, and move forward with their businesses and their lives and their pastimes and for them to lose that not only one year but now we've lost them two three years in a row uh for some of them yeah uh like some of the ones down southern new south wales they'd lost 2019 as well uh to the floods and bushfires and stuff so they lost 2019 2020 and now they've lost 2021 as well and that is just devastating for them communities and, and some of them shows and uh, organizations will never run again uh, and there's sadly no support. And that's absolutely uh, devastating for those communities to lose that source of education and uh, that source of uh, income and community spirit that that should be there for those small local communities because that's what brings them together as communities. And, and they look forward to that every year, all of those kids as well as adults. And, and um, they, they try and come together for those events to really make the community shine. Yeah, absolutely, buddy. No, well said. Well, Gerald, mate, I've got to thank you very much for coming on for a yarn. I, I really appreciate it. Um, everyone loved watching you through the show, mate. It was it was fantastic. It was really, really good to see. And, um, you know, it's it's a pleasure to, to speak to you today, mate. I really appreciate it. I've got one more question before we finish up. What's next for you, buddy? What do you, what do you got in the pipeline? Uh, well, we, we will have to wait and see. I mean, I... I'd love to be able to have a crack at maybe an all-star season of Survivor sometime, but uh, we'll just have to wait and see on that one. Yep. Uh, hopefully we can get some shows up and running again and I can get around Australia and uh, and promote wood shopping and uh, country 
life, shows, etc. cetera, uh, more to people and showcase that. Uh, <clears throat> and I don't know, maybe we get to see me in the public light somewhere else. I just, yeah, I, I love educating people and uh, being able to push forward and show people what life can be uh, in every aspect of it, not only necessarily country life, but just uh, enjoying life to its fullest. Uh, so hopefully we can do something in that sort of space, but uh, we just got to wait and see what arises and what opportunities pop up, I suppose. Well, nothing can be predicted at the moment with everything that's happening, buddy. I think we've all just got to sit out and, and wait and see what happens. And in the meantime, create some ideas and go for it. And hopefully it all falls through in the end and, and comes on through for us. So um, you're a legend, mate. Thanks so much for coming on for a yarn. I really appreciate it, eh? Absolutely. Thanks, mate, again for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure and uh, hopefully we can speak again soon. We'll do it, mate, for sure. Thank you.